So the European left is quick to riot against Trump. But here's the interesting thing. European populations aren't actually that hostile to his policies. Consider Trump's proposal to ban immigration temporarily from half a dozen Muslim-majority countries. Outrageous, right? Well, actually, most Europeans don't think it goes nearly far enough. A poll this year found that majorities in France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, and several other countries backed a total halt to Muslim immigration into their countries. In fact, in every country in Europe polled, support for such a ban was far higher than overt opposition to it. Kind of amazing. Well, how about the president's plan to build a wall? Well, we're told in this country that it's morally offensive. Nobody does it because it doesn't work. And yet many European governments feel differently about their own borders. Hungary just built a wall on the Serbian border, for example. Macedonia walled off Greece. Slovenia has a wall on the Croatian border. Austria isn't just putting up a fence on the Italian border. It's also sending soldiers to defend it. Trump's anti-migrant wall may be a crime against humanity, but in Europe, walls are good policy and they're supported by the population. Even on global warming, there's not as much difference as you might think. Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord supposedly marked the total end of American global leadership. All the news anchors here said so repeatedly. But actually, that's not such a crazy view in Europe, believe it or not. A 2015 Pew survey found that only 42% of Europeans were very worried about global warming, meaning most people there share the president's lack of all-consuming urgency on that question. In other words, Europe is much closer to America than most of us realize, at least on the issues. Trump's views aren't considered extreme there either. He's just hated by elites on both continents. John Daniel Davidson is a senior correspondent at The Federalist, and he joins us tonight. John, these numbers are a little striking considering the coverage of the president's trip abroad has basically framed it as this buffoon among the sophisticates. And of course, they must hate him for his backward views, but their population seem to agree with him. Yeah, it's it's very similar to what we see in coverage of Trump here in the U.S. You know, the same narrative that Trump is a buffoon, out of step with mainstream Americans, um, you know, holds these offensive policy views and wants to do all these terrible things. But, you know, there was just a poll released on Wednesday by Politico showing that a majority of Americans surveyed support a travel ban along the lines of what Trump has proposed for Muslim majority countries. Uh, so, you know, this this idea that his ideas are out of the mainstream is totally false, not just in Europe, but here in the U.S. as well. It's just you don't hear that in the media because that's not what the elites think. Well, because that's also not what they cover. So they cover the president himself, his tweets, his behavior, which is yeah. a whole separate thing. I mean, it has a whole separate response from the public when you poll on it. Do you approve of the president's tweets? No, not really. Say most people. But you almost never hear straight coverage of what he's actually proposing, what his ideas are. Those seem like they've always been popular. This is not a new thing. Yeah, and the interesting thing about this poll on Wednesday was that the language of the poll actually excluded any references to Trump. The question is, would right. you support a State Department policy that restricts immigration from these Muslim-majority countries? And, you know, 55 percent of people said, yeah, uh, I would support that. And it's exactly as you say. The media wants to focus on Trump the person, not on the administration's policies, which have always been a lot more popular than the media gives uh, the administration credit for. I have to say, maybe the headline here, and this is never reported that I'm aware of, is how far out of step the people who run Western Europe and the United States are with their own populations. These are supposed to be democracies, and yet their views bear no resemblance in a lot of cases on big issues to the views of the people they're supposedly governing. Yeah, and it's an, it's an uncomfortable thing to bring up, especially when we talk about the EU. The EU is not a very democratic institution. When you look at the majorities right. of people in Poland, uh, in other parts of Europe, they support these policies that the EU elites themselves uh, really deplore. In fact, you know, there's talk earlier this year uh, of the EU sanctioning the Czech Republic and Poland uh, and Hungary for their immigration policy. Well, huge majorities in those countries favor restricting migrants. They don't want their country to be flooded with migrants the way Germany has been. And the EU wants to punish them for that. So, you know, when we talk about EU or, you know, European elites, 
we're not really talking about people who care all that much what actual citizens of Poland want or think. Well, you see that here in this country on display every day. Right. How long can fake democracy continue? Well, I think we're seeing the repercussions, the backlash from that. You know, you had Trump's election, which was obviously a backlash to the political establishment of both parties in this country. Then you had Brexit. Then you had Marine Le Pen, you know, with a historic run at the French yeah. presidency. And I think that you're going to see this more and more as people get fed up with the idea that elites in Brussels or in Washington or some far off capital know what's best for people, don't care what they want and try to impose policies that are just not popular. It's going to be a rising tide of populism until the elites can figure this out. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing, I think, to think you know what's best. I mean, I think we all sort of think we know what's best. But to not care what the people who elected you think is a, is a different thing entirely and not sustainable. I agree with you, John. I appreciate your coming on tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> to my friends on the Security Council, I must say that today is a dark day. It is a dark day because yesterday's actions by North Korea made the world a more dangerous place. Their illegal missile launch was not only dangerous, but reckless and irresponsible. It showed that North Korea does not want to be part of a peaceful world. They have cast a dark shadow of conflict on all nations that strive for peace. Yesterday's act came from the same vicious dictator who sent a young college student back home to his parents, unresponsive and in a coma. For Americans, the true nature of the North Korean regime was painfully brought home with the images of two guards holding Otto Warmbier up as they transported him from a prison he should never have been in. Otto Warmbier is but one person out of millions who have been killed, tortured, or deprived of their human rights by the North Korean regime. To Americans, the death of one innocent person can be as powerful as the death of millions because all men and women are created in God's image Depravity toward one is a sure sign of willingness to do much more harm. The nature of the North Korean regime is clear. Only the scale of the damage it does could become different. That's why yesterday's escalation is so alarming. If North Korea will treat an innocent young student the way it treated Otto Warmbier, we should not be surprised if it acts barbarically on a larger scale. The United States does not seek conflict. In fact, we seek to avoid it. We seek only the peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and an end to the threatening actions by North Korea. Regrettably, we're witnessing just the opposite. Make no mistake, North Korea's launch of an ICBM is a clear and sharp military escalation. The North Korean regime openly states that its missiles are intended to deliver nuclear weapons to strike cities in the United States, South Korea, and Japan. And now it has greater capacity to do so. In truth, it is not only the United States and our allies that are threatened. North Korea's destabilizing escalation is a threat to all nations in the region and beyond. Their actions are quickly closing off the possibility of a diplomatic solution. The United States is prepared to use the full range of our capabilities to defend ourselves and our allies. One of our capabilities lies with our considerable military forces. We will use them if we must, but we prefer not to have to go in that direction. We have other methods of addressing those who threaten us and of addressing those who supply the threats. We have great capabilities in the area of trade. President Trump has spoken repeatedly about this. I spoke with him at length about it this morning. There are countries that are allowing, even encouraging, trade with North Korea in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. Such countries would also like to continue their trade such countries would also like to continue their trade arrangements with the United States. That's not going to happen. Our attitude on trade changes when countries do not take international security threats seriously. Before the path to a peaceful solution is entirely closed, however, there remains more that the international community can and must do, diplomatically and economically. 
In the coming days, we will bring before the Security Council a resolution that raises the international response in a way that is proportionate to North Korea's new escalation. I will not detail the resolution here today, but the options are all known to us. If we are unified, the international community can cut off the major sources of hard currency to the North Korean regime. We can restrict the flow of oil to their military and their weapons program. We can increase air and maritime restrictions. We can hold senior regime officials accountable. The international community has spoken frequently against the illegal and dangerous actions of the North Korean regime. For many years, there have been numerous UN sanctions against North Korea, but they have been insufficient to get them to change their destructive course. So in order to have an impact, in order to move North Korea off its military escalation, we must do more. We will not look exclusively at North Korea. We will look at any country that chooses to do business with this outlaw regime. We will not have patience for stalling or talking our way down to a watered-down resolution. Yesterday's ICBM escalation requires an escalated diplomatic and economic response. Time is short. Action is required. The world is on notice. If we act together, we can still prevent a catastrophe, and we can rid the world of a grave threat. If we fail to act in a serious way, there will be a different response. Much of the burden of enforcing UN sanctions rests with China. 90% of trade with North Korea is from China. We will work with China. We will work with any and every country that believes in peace. But we will not repeat the inadequate approaches of the past that have brought us to this dark day. We cannot forget the multiple missile tests this year or yesterday's escalation. We cannot forget Otto Warmbier and others North Korea continues to hold. We cannot forget the threats to our friends and allies around the world. We will not forget, and we will not delay. Thank you.